Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Andrew. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, Michael. And uh, it, you know, it's a real pleasure meeting you and, and chatting to you today. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. This will be an unusual topic we're going to eventually be talking about, so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's certainly something, a topic that I'm interested in in my life. I have been latterly in my life. So uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. So as I do with all of my guests, I start things off by asking one opening question, and that is, tell us a little bit about your personal life, Andrew. So where were you born? Have you moved around? Where did you go to school? Tell us a little bit about your education, mm -hmm. and then we'll go into your career, first jobs and things, and then hopefully get to current day. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, uh, I'm up here on the Wirral at the moment, the Wirral Peninsula, and we've been living here for about three years. And it's interesting that you said, you know, uh, have you moved around much? I'll, I'll cover that shortly. But I, yes. I, was, I was born literally a mile and a half across the river in Liverpool. And it's funny because there's a, there was an old, uh, there's a, we have a lot, a lot of local productions in theatre here. And one of the local productions a number of years ago uh, was called Brick Up the Mersey Tunnel or Brick Up the Tunnel. So literally bricking up the tunnel. And it's yes. weird. a mile and a half. There's so many people from Liverpool living here, but there's so many people who live here, work in Liverpool and go through the tunnel every day. But it's almost like this, uh, it's almost like this in intercontinental divide. It's like, you know, traveling to the other side of the moon. People say, the Wirral, I'm not going to the Wirral. It's like five minutes. It, it's 1.8 miles in the tunnel. Uh, right. so I live this side and the people say, should we go to Liverpool? So, oh, all the way to Liverpool. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, you people wouldn't think twice about going the other way, 20 miles into North Wales uh, for, for a day out or to walk up some of the mountains. So that's where I am that, and that's where I was born. Uh, early years, with literally, you know, mom, dad, uh, two brothers and a sister, I'm the eldest of four. And uh, ever since I was a young, young lad, I'd always wanted to travel, uh, see the world, and as a youngster, anybody that was going anywhere at any point, I'd be tagging onto them uh, to yeah. travel with them. And, you know, my mom's brother, uh, when I was 12, said to me, Andrew, you know, you've got to decide where you're going and what you're doing and what you're going to do for a living. I was like, I'm joining the Air Force. And I told him at 12, and I said, as soon as I leave school, I'm joining the Air Force. And I tried at 16, and the way it works, uh, Michael, like, in, you know, if there's no openings, you know, they tell you to come back. And they said... We're not recruiting for that particular trade for about two years. Right. And come back in two years' time. And, you know, sort of jumping ahead slightly to what we're going to be talking about today, intuition and things like that, uh, I, I jumped out of bed one day, put a suit on, and said to my mom, I'm heading to the careers office. And uh, this was about 12 months after they told me to come back in two years. And I stood outside the door, 8 a.m. Uh, on a Monday morning, and this sergeant opened the door and said, what do you want? And I said, well, I've come to join the Air Force. And I told him what I wanted to be and how, you know, what trade I wanted. Yes. And he had a piece of paper in his hand and he went, I've just got the signal here to say we can start recruiting for that trade today. And I was like, <gasps> let me in. And uh, so people always say to me, when were you first aware of your intuition? There's other, other instances, but that's, so that's the start of the beginning of my adult life. Yeah. Uh, left home, uh, joined the Air Force for 23 years. I uh, had a fairly conventional education, you know, what we call a comprehensive then, which is secondary school. Uh, mainly went to night school after I left home and joined the Air Force, got various qualifications, technical qualifications, went to, col uh, went to college. And, yes. uh, and even as a young boy, uh, you know, opportunities were different back then, Michael. And, uh, you know, I'd always, always wanted, I thought, I'd love to have a degree. I would love to get myself a degree. And it's something that just stuck with me, and I, I never really let go of that. And an opportunity came up through the Air Force to study for an engineering degree, and I, I didn't get it till I was 35. But I went, I've got my, something I'd always wanted. I've got my piece of paper, and yes. I'm, I'm so really proud as punch about that because no disrespect to anybody that goes to university these days, but I literally grew up, uh, you know, met somebody, got married, and then 
eventually later on I got married again and then had children and there was always some other priority and the, the, the education was slipping further and further down the pecking order yes and when I got offered this chance I went do you know what I'm going to grab it I'm going to do it and even if I just say you know it's mine and uh, my eldest son who's at uni now both are he often used to say to me dad why do you never use your degree your degrees I said it was something I wanted to do but believe it or not there's a part of the degree which is all about human resources and if you like the human factor of your job yes you, i use it every single day and to this day i still use elements of it but not the engineering bit so uh but there you have it that, that's the that takes you right up to uh probably until about age 40 42 when uh that's around about the time i, I left the air force uh, i was out in iraq uh, that was my last tour, operational tour, and I came home and thought, Do you know what, enough's enough. Uh, I, I've done my 23 years. Uh, maybe time for somebody else to sort of take the baton and uh, run with it. But it was during that period uh, when I was in Iraq, just before then, about six months previous, I started to really be drawn to spiritual churches, and I'd always had an interest. I was always conscious of the fact that there was something more to life than what we just do now and what where we are right now mm. and even when my grandfather who i was quite close to he he died when i was 10 and although i was you know very upset at that personal loss something just said to me he's not gone he's not gone and i i didn't know what that was and i, I firmly believe to this day that you can't necessarily instill that in somebody you either believe in something like that or you don't or something yes. ha something has got to happen for you to go my mind has been turned or you know uh, i've changed my mind because or yes. too many co coincidences are happening uh, i i call it sort of uh you know synchronicity if you like or divine time and there's too many things happening here that are now leading me to ask questions so that's for everybody else to decide for themselves and, and i certainly don't try and change people's minds no. but when i was in iraq uh there was uh one morning i was just sat there and I, we used to have half a day off uh, which was a sunday morning for me and i was just sat there trying to read a book uh, and i was sat there and thought i can't get comfortable and and this was this was probably a few weeks into my tour, so maybe February, March time. And even back then, it was still getting pretty damn hot in the day. And, you know, in this country, it gets to mid-afternoon. You go, wow, that heat's really building up. When mm. you're sort of almost on the equator and Iraq is almost at sea level as well, mm. uh, it, it's no getting warm. It's just this, it's like somebody just flicked the oven on or flicked the heating on. It's just That's this, right. wow, it's hot. It's 45 degrees almost instantly. And uh, I was sat there, couldn't get comfortable. There was flies everywhere. And I moved my chair just further along from where I was, just, out, just outside, because we were literally living in two of us uh, in sort of 10 by 8, which is maybe three meters by two and a half meters, mm. you know, uh, cabins. So there was me and another, he was an army captain. I was a flight lieutenant at the Air Force. Yes. And uh, just to get outside and just some space. And it was at that point I saw something glistening in the sand and uh i thought why is that and it really did look like a ring pull from a coke can or you know a fizzy drink or soda pop the americans call it and uh I, I bent down and picked the ring up and on the end of it was this clog which you can see now the ring is long gone but that clog was literally in the sand in the iraqi desert three thousand miles from home uh and the weird thing was that i'd moved my chair that day and somehow kick this thing and it was buried about two inches down but yes. the ring pull was sticking out of the, or the bit where you attach your keys that yeah, was yeah. Stick, just about glistening in the in, in the sunlight yes and i i pulled it by the ring and that was on the end and it was at that point that there was uh the best way i can describe it is uh if you've ever been present as a man at the birth of your children, uh, and they always tell you, you know, men cry at the birth of the children. Uh, and when my eldest son was born, I was like, okay, I, I know all about this. I'm, I'm ready for this. And then just this overwhelming emotion just came from nowhere. And these tears were flooding down my face. Uh, 
So, it, and that's the exact feeling. And I was suddenly aware of my grandfather's presence, uh, the grandfather I mentioned before who died when I was 10. Mm. And it's almost like somebody put a duvet over me, you know, and wrapped it around me. And you know, don't forget, you know, I'm a six foot five guy, you know, mm. uh, I'm not the smallest guy in the world. And I just felt so emotional and i felt like the all consuming love all around me and it's something that wow. literally moved my soul at the time yeah. I'm, I'm there with my rifle next to me i've got full body armor on i've got my helmet on yeah. you know and then suddenly having this really spiritual emotional soul touching experience mm. the minute i picked that clog up and you know you know you may think well what's the clog got to do with it all Mm. Well, well, my paternal grandfather, who passed away when I was 10, and, sorry, my, that's my maternal, my, my mom's dad, as yes. well as my paternal grandfather, they were both Dutch. And right. uh, it was my mom's dad's presence that I felt all around me at that time. And, you know, when we were growing up as children, my mom has still got clogs everywhere in the house. She's got Delft blue everywhere in the house. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, play to play. And I'll, I'll show you something else quickly here. Oh, uh, yes. This was actually from my, actually, yeah, I'll tell you what, let me put my glasses on because I know this is uh, going out like 1967 Christmas from Grandad Glastra. There you go. So a piece of Delft blue from uh, the Beautiful. Netherlands. Yeah. yeah. And there's another piece at the end of the mantelpiece. You can just see it in the corner down oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's everywhere, as you know. It's very popular, sort of Dutch. Yes. Uh, uh, Dutch uh, pottery, wherever you like. That's right. Um, and my dad also had a restaurant called Clogs as well. Uh, and <laughs> he, he, he stole all the clogs out the house to put them on the walls. And then they eventually sold the restaurant. And my mum bought a pub. And uh, she literally worked there until about three years ago, until she was about 75. And oh. we put all the clogs on one of the walls where nobody could reach them. Like the, the wall was above the stairs and it started about eight foot above your head uh, yes. because people would help themselves to these clogs and take them home and then bring them oh, back. Oh, God. You know, a <laughs> few too many beers, take a clog home and bring it back six months later. Yes. Uh, yeah, so that's that. And like I said, I'd already had. I was already being drawn to spiritualist churches, and yes. uh, I'd literally just gone into one in Swindon and Wiltshire because you asked about travel. Well, I've been in the Air Force. Me and my wife have lost count of how many houses we've been in. We, we've mm. been been in about twenty houses uh, in the in the twenty five years we've been together. Uh, yes. So I was just drawn to the spiritualist church. Went in, found out what that was all about. Then found myself in Iraq. Came back from Iraq. Decided enough was enough. Chose to leave. Went to work for my family business because my, all my family worked in the pub, which had also become a small hotel. Yes. Uh, so B and B, and I stayed there. And then one day, thought, do you know what? My mediumship, because I started going to spiritualist churches more, started mm. developing more. And I thought, yes. do you know what? I feel it's being drawn to this. Yeah. Almost a bit like a nurse, or maybe somebody in uh, a setting or a workplace that. They're not in it just for the money. They're just drawn to it, and it's a calling, mm. and they, mm. they do it because it's it's innate within them. And uh, mm. that sort of brings us up pretty much to the modern day because the business has grown since then. Uh, and, you know, I persuaded my wife to sell the house uh, because I, w I walked away from the family business, walked away from a wage. And I know small businesses are very much a sort of, you know, uh, something that you're really interested in people of, oh, with less than nine employees. And mm. Uh, mm. I said to my wife, you know, she well, what are we going to do for money? How are we going to survive? I said, why don't we rent somewhere? Why don't we sell the house and we'll live off the equity? And mm. that's exactly what we did. Now that's all gone. Uh, but we're still here and we're in the process of, you know, this is some 10, no, eight years ago. And we're yeah. in the process, literally, I've had a mortgage in principle today and we're looking for houses. So I've managed to turn it around and sort of we're now looking for, a house again so you know we're still here to tell the tale and still surviving and that's pretty much brought you up to date but i know you've got some more questions for me michael <laughs> <laughs> well yeah there are there are some questions that popped up um so where was the pub was that in in the wirral or liverpool oh, it, it was in liverpool it was right in the middle of a little area called the dingle uh which is yeah. part of toxteth and the dingle from my my understand the pub was called the pineapple it's mm. now can be being converted and bought and sold and converted into apartments by somebody else. Uh, but the area was sort of the dingle and it was, it's only about a mile square, this area. And it, it's part of the Holy Land because the streets are named after 
biblical figures. There's Jacob Street, David Street, uh, Isaac Street, and I can't remember the other one, but there was four of them. Uh, I'm sure I remember that too. And it was literally all part of that, just off Park Road in Liverpool. Okay, brilliant. And then um, tell us a little bit more about the Dutch family connection then, because you said your grandfather on your, your 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 mother's father your grandfather was yeah, yeah, dutch yeah. and the other one was dutch as well mm -hmm. so what nationality is your mum is your dad or was your dad yeah what, yeah i mean what nationality are they yeah they, they were both born in liverpool uh right and, you know a lot of people say to me oh so you speak dutch then and of course when i was growing up in the 70s i mean you know this pre your you know, pre during the joining Europe and you know to have mm, yes. somebody with to have somebody with a, a foreign name in the class uh, yes. you know it's a bit of a novelty where it, it's a lot more widespread these days with the amount of people have traveled and moved around within Europe yeah uh, but my, my both of my grandfathers met my grandmothers during the second world war in Liverpool and right. when people say oh do you speak Dutch no it was never spoken because uh, for two reasons uh but basically both grandfathers sort of met my grandmothers got married and then went back to sea again it was the war time and my mother was actually about 18 months old before her father even saw her uh so dutch was just never spoken in the house because they, they were never there no. and uh so my mom and dad were both raised in liverpool uh obviously met each other we yes. were raised we were raised in liverpool and uh we but still it was got... just coincidence that they both had dutch fathers Yes and no, because right. I, I, I'm going to say no. It wasn't so much a coincidence. So uh, good, good, good question. Uh, because the you know back then people would have a club. You know they'd have like the Jamaican club or whatever it might be. And there was actually a Dutch club that um, right. My mum and dad both went to. Right. And I believe they met there. And uh, my mum's dad was always trying to marry my mum off to some other Dutch guy, you know. <laughs> of <course. laughs> you know yeah, because that, that's where they would all meet. And, you know, people remain within their own communities. Yeah. And I, I often wonder, you know, you know, if that had happened, would we have all been raised in, in the Netherlands? Or would, it, would those Dutch guys have stayed here? And the story would have been pretty much the same. So yeah, it's a bit of a sort of convoluted story. And, okay, uh, no, no, that, that's I, I'm just intrigued as to how that all came about. And yeah. do you know which part of the Netherlands they were from? Uh, yeah, uh, let me get uh, now. My dad's dad was from Rotterdam. Yeah, uh, and you know, I'm not sure about my mum's dad, but I know my great grandfathers uh, on my mum's side were from Friesland, so uh, further north. Uh, yes. Uh, do you know I'm going to have to I don't th my, my mum's dad I don't think it was Amsterdam but my dad's dad was definitely from Rotterdam Rotterdam uh, okay. a, sea a seafaring port and pretty much like Liverpool really yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Oh, fascinating yeah of yeah. course I mean I'm originally from Amsterdam um, so but interestingly enough it, the reason I'm interested in the story of how they met and all of mm -hmm. this business is because my my mother just very briefly i interject to help people sure sure yeah yeah and how i ended up in england so my my father was dutch but my mother was anglo-indian and my mother's sister was a pan pal in india with my father who's in the netherlands mm -hmm. and who wrote to him to say my sister is visiting london why don't you go and meet up with her mm -hmm. And the rest is history. So, you know, so he he fell in love with his pen pal sister in London. Yeah. Um, got married and lived in Amsterdam. We were born. Uh, ironically, there's three boys and one girl in my family, as well. And then my father worked for the Bank of America. We travelled the world a little bit. We eventually then moved to London, or actually, mm -hmm. sorry, but he worked in London. And we basically stayed in the UK ever since. So I've been here for over 40 years. But um, again, it's a really convoluted way yeah, in yeah. those days how people met each other. Um, and actually, my father was, you know, he stayed in the Netherlands during the, 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 war, the Second World War, but he was the only son. Uh, and he actually hid in an attic for all that period 
at the age of 16 or whatever and never spoke about it either we we don't really know what happened because uh, oh, he wouldn't yeah. speak about it because it really made a big impact on him obviously as yeah. a young lad so and, and that will be the london connection i was talking about before yeah probably yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's right yeah. so um so it's interesting how i mean there used to be a saying when i came over to the uh, the uk and we'd gone to suriname for a while which used to be a dutch colony and we were there for three years but there used to be that saying i used we were traveling around and, and stuff like that to say the dutch are all over the world which was the saying that was going around in the mm -hmm. 70s because literally netherlands as you know is such a small country sure, they kind sure. of went all around the world mm -hmm. so okay so that's the the dutch connection which is incredible the can i share something can i share something as well with you on my on that i know i know mm. suriname is part of the dutch east indies but my grandfather's house that i was talking about before there was two plaques on the wall and it just answered my question there was one plaque that said rotterdam so i think he was from there the other plaque next to it was from when he went to the dutch east indies and it had the plaque said suriname uh, on it, and that was in the hallway in his house. So uh, you're really? right. The Dutch literally are everywhere. A bit like the Irish. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's more Irish people all over the world. If you tried to send them all back home, there wouldn't be enough room for them. No, no, that's right. That's right. And and I actually lived in Ireland for a while as well. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> so okay, brilliant. So now, um, going back to the spiritualist church. Mm -hmm where you were drawn to it but when you when you said you were drawn to it um did somebody introduce you to it and how did you get to know about it and, and i mean there was no introductions whatsoever uh and when i was about 17 uh it, it's weird because these days you you google you know psychic readings or mediums or clairvoyance or whatever back back in the day there was i mean as you know there was none of that i mean facebook is only about 10 years old 12 years old maybe yeah uh so, you know, there was often the, the ladies in the family because it was very much their thing. Uh, That's right. <clears throat> and my mum used to go for readings with various people. Uh, and I said, what's it all about? You know, can I go? So I'd, I'd always had an avid interest. And like I said, even when my grandfather passed away, I sort of knew he'd gone somewhere uh, or hadn't left us totally. Yes. And uh, so... I was living in Wiltshire at the time. I was based at RAF Line, which is now an army base. And uh, I, I was out one day, and we'd also previously, previous to living at, uh, in, in Wiltshire, we lived in Buckinghamshire, uh, at a place called RAF uh, High Wycombe. And there was an old disused spiritualist church, but the plaque was still up. And we were just out one day. I was like, ooh. And I often find this even today with the work I do. Something resonates with me or something is just draws me in. I was like, wow, okay, yeah, okay. And it, it just played on my mind. And then when we went to Wiltshire, uh, because you, I used to move every two years, uh, and I was in Swindon one day, and it just said, you know, uh, Swindon Spiritualist Church. And I was sat there looking at it. And then another time, I just went back and was look, and then I said to my wife, uh, I don't even know where I said I was going. Uh, oh, that's it. She said, where are you off to? I said, I'm off to church. And she said, you've got another woman. I was like, I think I'd have a better excuse than I'm going to church. Uh, <laughs> I'm off to church, honey. See you later. And I said, it's a spiritual church. I said, I just want to go and have a look. And she just went, okay, see you later. And uh, my, my boys were about five or six. And yeah, there's three uh, Three years between, so five and two, six and four, three, something like that. Yes. And uh, I went to the church and I just sat outside and I saw people going in. And I just parked up the car uh, and walked in. And this, I still remember the guy to this day, a guy called Jeff at uh, Swindon Spiritualist Church. And he said, oh, hi, can I help you? I said, yeah. I said I was really drawn to the church and just thought to come and see what it was all about. And... Uh, he said, great, come and have a seat. So we sat, and it was what was then was the open circle. A lot of people who are familiar with it, open circle or closed circle or whatever it may be. Uh, and the open circle is that anybody can go in and anybody can be part of it. Yes. And I, I was just sort of sat there, not really having a clue, and did a little meditation and a few other bits. And uh, Jeff came up and he said, right, everybody, Andrew's got a message for somebody. I was like, what's a message? And he came behind me, put my, his hands on my shoulders. I was sat down and he said, right, all I want you to do is close your eyes, tell me what you see. And he asked me a number of questions. Mm. And uh, I said, I can 
see this and I can see that. And I can't remember the exact details now. And I'm well aware of this man. And I think he had a brief case and so on and so forth. And I opened my eyes and I said, I'm really drawn to you, to the guy across the way. And I said, I can also see almost, you know, when you see CGI now in uh, movies and yes. people can be part cyborg or part android or whatever, yes. like, like yes. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Terminator, you know. And I looked at this guy and it's almost like these little mechanical devices were superimposed over one side of his chest. And I said, I, I see these little mechanical devices. I said, it's like they're pumping blood around your body and he said, I understood a lot of what you said before about the guy that you saw in your third eye. Mm. Uh, but he said, I literally had replacement heart valves about four months ago. Uh, mm. He said, and that's what you're seeing. And he said, and Jeff said, well done, everybody. Oh, sorry, well done, Andrew. Andrew's given his first message and I got a round of applause. And, and it, it stemmed from there, became, right. part of, became part of the church. And, you know, and of course, with moving with the Air Force, you know, then we moved... Uh, had to find another church, become part of that. And then I, I left the Air Force and we'd already bought a, a house back up here in Liverpool. And yeah. I started attending the local spiritualist church. And it's literally grown ever since then, alongside working for my family. But then I decided to, you know, go it alone. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. And you also studied at the Arthur Findlay College? Yeah, down in Stansted. Uh, yeah. it, it's a bit weird, really, uh, because I've, I've been drawn to it. And uh, as anybody knows, it's, it's not the cheapest gay in the world you know, to go down there. But I will say excellent value for money because you get three square meals a day. You get your accommodation as part of the package. And they really do look after you. And it's a great week. But as part of leaving the military, you're entitled to do some resettlement courses. The idea is if you want to be a plumber or you want to be an electrician or a brain surgeon, they will pay for you to go on courses and do the courses uh, yes. to re retrain into another, you know, another trade or employment. And I was already on the books for, because you get a, peri a period of resettlement leave. Uh, yes. So I was sort of still in the Air Force, yeah, not in the Air Force, but also working for my family at the same time, uh, unpaid, of course, because you couldn't be earning money while you were still in the Air Force. Anyway, <clears throat> but I, I was sort of getting some hands-on experience within the pub environment. And uh, I decided to enroll on these courses down at the Arthur Finley College. And the Air Force gave me a car to go in because it was still considered to be duty so they gave me a car to go in there uh, and i spent a week down there and had an amazing time and i i spent my full allowance on training courses at the arthur finley college and i went to, i went to, oh, a bit about half a dozen times in total uh, yeah. but i decided from there on in that i wanted to learn differently and luckily through uh, you know i eventually moved to staffordshire uh because i decided believe it or not that I thought as long as I'm close to work and I'm on my, my family and as long as I'm close to the business, I'd always get drawn in. And I thought I've got to stand on my own two feet. I've got to make this work for myself. So when we sold the house, as I mentioned before, to live off the equity, we rent, we rented somewhere a hundred miles away uh, right. just so I could go, this is what I'm concentrating on. There's no going back. There's no crutch here. You've got yeah. to make this work. Wow. Uh, so I, I got involved with Stafford church and I did a lot of development and mediumship development through the church there as well. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. So you, you did all your training, you've been going to spiritualist church, you then had to decide to make it work for yourself. How, yeah. how did you get started with all of that? How did you even start looking for clients? How, how did you even start, right, I need to do readings to earn money or tell us about how that happened? Well, like I said, Michael, I mean, this was pretty much pre-Facebook, pre-social media. Yes. I mean, very, very pretty much. I mean, when, I mean, I left the Air Force in 2008, so Facebook didn't exist then. There was no social media. I think there was sort of muted noise about this Apple device called a smartphone, and it was literally, right. the, literally the first iPhone. Uh, would have been maybe 12, 13 years ago, around that point. So there wasn't the connectivity in the, and the the you know the interaction that you can have these days with podcasts and who knows what else that's right. uh, it literally was word of mouth and it was the liverpool echo and i just, I just put an advert in there uh psychic readings available call this number and, and that was it and so i was working uh working my day job and then going out in the evenings and do go to houses and doing readings and things like that and little parties and things God. uh and when we decided to move to the Midlands, it pretty much carried on the same way. I was doing a lot of stage work, renting venues, 
uh, you know, I just put my name out there and just sort of, so I still get a lot of connections to the Midlands because yes. I, I, I was down there for four or five years. Yes. And, uh, and then of course, uh, so there was that sort of word of mouth almost, which you, you cannot buy. Mm. And even if people look at your websites and your reviews and everything else on, on the internet, people can yeah. still look at your well, yeah. So word of mouth really does sort of sell. Yeah. Uh, so, it, it, I mean, that was it. It was starts off with an advert in the paper, and then it was through word of mouth, and then just getting to know people and networking. I was then sort of getting involved in mind, body, and spirit fairs, going to some little yes. ones, some big ones. Yes. Uh, the NEC, London, Alexandra Palace, things like that. Yes. Uh, through, through different companies. Uh, and I did a lot of local ones. Uh, but I'll tell you what I did find as well, Michael. Uh, the, they, they became popular because some people quickly caught onto the idea that, wow, if I charge all these people 200 quid for the weekend and just give them a table and advertise the, you know, the event, and I quickly realized that I was spending the whole weekend away from home, uh, traveling to these events, paying to stay, stay over, paying for the event, and I was barely breaking even. And I thought, mm. Mm, you know, uh, and I got, the, I, I got that mindset that I thought, well, why don't I just keep the money in my pocket and try and do it another way? But strangely enough, there's people who still come back to me occasionally today and say, I saw you in Northwich or I saw you in Nantwich or I saw you in Stafford 10 years ago. I was like, yes. wow. So people do remember you, but of course-, of course. Maybe there was just something at the back of it all. I don't know. Something just said, go it alone, do your thing, find mm. your way. And mm. if you think about it, it, a lot of the psychics and mediums and clairvoyants and people in the that sort of world mm. uh, relied heavily on the mind, body, and spirit first. And, of course, That's right. if you look at where we are now, uh, they're all probably, wow, I've literally just had my legs cut from underneath me with this pandemic. So, yeah. uh, so me going it alone and finding my way and, finding different avenues uh i I think that's just me to be honest with you michael i think that's just me as a person that i like to find my way and and solve puzzles how do i get my name out there how do i do this how do i work work this out Mm. uh so yeah so a bit of an inquisitive mind really so excuse me (coughs) so uh, i've always wanted to investigate and find things out and see how things work and then see see how i can fit into that puzzle and make it work for myself so i've, I've always enjoyed challenges in that direction so maybe yeah. who knows maybe i'd give myself obstacles to climb just for something to do rather than take the easy route well i i think you know for every for any small business to try and make a, a living you have to continually innovate mm. and make sure that you know, you're going to get paid next month because otherwise it just dries up and you can get very demotivated. So there has to be a lot of Mm self-motivation to do that exploration because you haven't got somebody telling you, okay, now you need to go and do this. You know, you've literally got to make it up yourself. And whether it's, you know, doing animations or whether it's doing, you know, hairdressing or whether it's doing psychic readings, the, the the it applies for for all of them you know you've got to continually experiment and innovate you also you also did some tv correct and radio yeah yeah i did uh i started off uh like i said when I, when i moved to the midlands in fact there's a there's a, there's a lady i know now and she's appeared a few she's a pet psychic so to speak uh, and I got to know her through these various events. And sometimes I've, I've totally lost track how, how I got to meet people or who mm. passed my name onto whoever. But yes. I, when I was living in the Midlands, I got invited to, uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to think. I can't even remember the name of where it was. There was a hotel in the Midlands, and it was known for haunted nights and things like that. Oh, yes. And I, and I got invited along and met various people. And one guy there had his own radio show. Uh, Mike Spirit FM on uh, what you call it, uh, Blog Talk Radio. So that was sort of the oh, first yeah. place, and he wanted me to have my own show. Uh, and then uh, there was various other online channels fell out of that, and I was on I was on Stafford Radio for uh, Stafford FM for a while, uh, but yes. that just never took off because that was very much in its infancy and there's a lot of teething troubles. Right. And then somebody else, a lady who used to organize the My Body and Spirit Fairs, which I talked about, uh, yeah. she was also she was also my Reiki master, and she was best mates with the guy that owned Canic Chase Radio, and he was looking for radio presenters. So 
you know, would you come along and do a slot in the evening? So that opened up. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, that ended because I decided to move to the States for a while, which I'll tell you about shortly. Okay. And, and when I came back up this way, back to the Northwest, uh, there was somehow somebody got hold of my name and it was a station that's now no longer with us uh, called Bliss Radio. And I was on there for a, a while. So there's that. And uh, through all these different people, uh, the TV side of things kicked off because uh, they were looking for uh, psychics, you know, TV psychics. And uh, it was somebody passed my name on there. And that was... Uh, it was oh uh, psychic today. It was called cha- it was channel eight eight six. I don't know why they keep moving around, but every time you try and find them, they're on a different channel. So yes. I, d- I don't. But they're on the upper echelons of the channels eight eight six 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 eight five eight five eight four. Not Sky one hundred one, which is BBC. Yes. Uh, and I, I was there for a while, and that that was really hard, really really hard work because it was essentially uh, you were on the telephone lines doing readings for people who had clocked in, but then presenting and it. I, I used to travel down to London. Uh, it was mainly in London, and I would travel from Liverpool on the on the on the express down there, yeah. go and do a six hour shift, which doesn't sound much, but it's full on for six hours. Yeah. And they used what they used to try and do to make it worth my while was I'd start a shift at nine p.m. It ran till three a.m. and then uh, they put you up in a little local B and B. And you, if you've ever been to a party or you've ever you know, being out late and you're talking and you never really sleep properly because your mind is so active. Mm. So I'd get to sleep about 5 or 6 a.m. and need to be back on air on the TV screens at 9 a.m. having had about three hours sleep. And it was in the centre of London in this mm. really, really, really noisy. Mm. And I was just absolutely destroyed when I used to come back home when I go, wow. But luckily that was only once a month. And right. I, got to, I got to know a lot of people through there. And then they eventually moved to Milton Keynes, and I was in the Midlands, so they were only an hour away. Yes. Uh, so I used to go down there, and they had what they called the Psychic's House, which they put everybody up in, and that was a lot better. Mm. But, of course, my own business was growing then, and uh, I was having to concentrate on my own business because I thought, well, the Psychic stuff's there on the TV, but I need to concentrate on what I'm doing and, yes. and yes. promote what I'm doing yes. uh, because there wasn't an awful lot of personal promotion that ever came out of the TV stuff, but mm. it's still mm. there on my YouTube channel. So the radio stuff's still there. Uh, I've always had an interest in broadcasting and putting things out there and finding the best way to put things out there. The, yes. TV, stuff, uh, the TV stuff was okay. It worked. But, you know, it's just a part of my journey, part of something I enjoy. I got to know more people, and people still get in touch with me through that medium, uh, pardon the pun. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it, you've got, you can't, when, you, when you're doing your own business, you never know where a strand is going to lead or where a connection is going to lead or mm. somebody's got your name. And uh, I'll give you a promise. But it's also part of your training as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's absolutely. your own development because, you know, people think, well, you're a psychic medium, so you should just be able to do it. You shouldn't need any training and development. But, you know, being under pressure, like being on TV or radio and getting people to call in and, you know, doing a reading just one after the other, it's yeah, just yeah. training that muscle uh, is getting better and better at doing it. Um, so, yeah, well done. Well done. Yeah. And you know, there was a huge clamp down at the time because, of course, I mean, I, I know ladies who were genuinely good psychics, but there was people uh, who were running businesses. Keep them on the phone. Keep them talking. You know, uh, you know. Of course, the meter was uh, the meter was running for these people, yes. and yes. and there was people uh, who were literally have no morals or scruples, just trying to squeeze every last ounce they could. So when I was working on the TV channel, you know, there was a you had to work with cards that you couldn't say where you were getting the information from. You couldn't talk about spiritual guides or the spirit world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had to say this card says this or if you were using runes or whatever, you had to prove where it was coming from. And yes. often people would contact the TV stations and just tell Andrew, you know, a uh, great reading, so spot on, but they couldn't give you that efficacy. They couldn't say, hey, Andrew, that guy's just phoned up and said how amazing you are. So we were so bound by government rules that it, yeah. you're, you're almost doing it with a straight jacket. But the guys, the producers would say, there's a note for you. That guy you just spoke to on the phone called back in because he said thank you uh, for helping him out. So, uh, yeah, so, and I've always, like I said, I've always liked to find my own way and grow spiritually. And I felt like I literally had handcuffs on at one point there. So, uh, 
and like you said, it is part of your training. You know, I do teach mediumship. I do teach psychic skills to people. But I say, here's the, if you like, here is the, the toolbox. You've got to go away and literally get it wrong. You know, uh, when you're working with people, learn the hard way, like in any trade, like in any, if you're a, a brain surgeon or a doctor or a plumber or whatever, you can do the training, but it's only when you get hands on. You, that's where the real learning begins. That's and right. It yeah. is no different to what I do. Yeah, right now. Yeah, I, and it's the same for every business. You know, you've got to you've got to learn by doing. Um, that's always been my motto, definitely. Mm, yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, you wanted to talk about the the states. Um, so tell us about that diversion. You went to America, is it? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was Massachusetts, and. Uh, it's sort of weird because somebody, again, through Blog Talk Radio, and I've just sent her an email this morning. So this lady and I go back <clears throat> about five years. And uh, she, uh, and through a friend of hers who had a little center out there, the Blue Angel Healing Center, uh, I think she's moved the location, but I think she's kept the name now. Her name's Jody. And, but my friend Mo, who's slightly crazy anyway, and she goes, hey, Andrew D., you've got to come to the USA. You've got to come to Massachusetts. And I <laughs> come to Boston. And uh, and something which is bugging me about this whole thing, um, you know when you feel totally and utterly compelled to do something with no rhyme or reason mm. or nothing to back it up whatsoever? And I said to my wife, I book flights to Boston, and I'm going like in three weeks. Uh so that was the start of that, and I went out there, and this lady, Jody organized uh, events and uh, me to do private readings for people. I did some mini shows and things. But I said to Spirit before I went there, I said, if I come back broke, I said, I will never, ever go again. And I actually came back about $200 up, you know, <laughs> with the cost <laughs> of accommodation and flights and rental cars. And, yes. and this, this, the, this is the blind faith I had, Michael, mm. uh, because I landed in Boston. You know, okay, there's Boston. Uh I think I went over to a garage, uh, bought a map of the area, and I've still got that map in my drawer today. And, it, and I still look at this map, this paper map. And, you know, this wasn't GPS no. uh, or sat navs. This wasn't no. smartphones. This wasn't Ask Google. Uh, this was a paper map. And, uh, you know, and I still look at this map to this day and look and go, I can't believe I just flew to Boston and just went, stayed in this Airbnb because that was just starting at the time mm. and met all these people. And it sort of flowed from there. And, uh, you know, and I literally got the map and drove down to Plymouth, Massachusetts, and then said to this lady, I was asking directions, where's this, where's that? And mm. the lady who owns the centre, Jody, I met her there. I literally jumped off the plane, drove down to her place in Carver, Massachusetts. And, uh, and she went, oh, hi, this is where we are. And I, I didn't have a clue where it was going or anything because the map wasn't that detailed. Did you get down here, go to the lights, get to the Shell gas station, turn right, head down half a mile, and your place is on the left. And the place I was staying in this Airbnb was literally a shack uh, oh. in the middle of the woods. I mean, I, oh I, my I, god! Yeah, yeah. I mean, the lady, <laughs> the lady was lovely, but they loved down there. They loved the more rustic down there for their vacation home. And oh, this, was a, yeah. this was a vacation home that this lady had rented off somebody else. Uh, and I was literally driving through the trees, and there was a point where I went between two trees which were touching the wing mirrors, and I pulled up and there was the front door. <laughs> but literally, drop down, and you're on the beach. I mean, walk nice. down the steps, you're on the beach. And I was like, what? And I lay there in the early hours of the morning, and I was like, what am I doing? You know, just what am I doing here? Uh, <laughs> needless to say, it all worked out. That was only for about two weeks, 10 days, two weeks. Yes, yes. Uh, and I went on a number of occasions. Sometimes I went back a couple of times a year. But then one time I said to my wife, I said, why don't we just go pack everything up in the house? Why don't we just go to the States, see what it's like living over there for three months, see if we can, you know, see if we like it. And mm. think, thinking a bit like Europe at the time before Brexit, you know, yeah. oh, yeah, you can just move to Holland. You can just move to Spain. Just just, just move. It's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we went on a tourist visa and we booked flights for like March 22nd. It would be March 22nd, 2016. Yeah, it was 2016 to come back on June the 5th or something like that. I still remember the, day, the dates. And... We gave up the house because we were renting it at the time, put everything into the storage, jumped on a plane, went to the States, give my mum to the dog, uh, give the dog to my mum. <laughs> and uh, I said, there you go, mum, we'll be back in three months. Uh, and my two boys came out to visit us uh, at the time. Uh, and it was great because they came out for Easter. They came out for uh, 
sort of the, the, the May bank holiday, school holiday for the week, and then flew, we all flew back together. Uh, and the really weird thing was, and like we were talking about synchronicity and divine timing, Michael, that I owned a house uh, at that point in Liverpool, which my mom was living in. My mom had her business. And she just rang me up one day and went, son, uh, I've given up the business and uh, I'm, 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 I'm sort of not working anymore. I was like, mm, okay. I put the phone down and I was like, oh, what about the mortgage? Mom, what about the mortgage? Well, yeah, I meant to ask you about the mortgage. Uh, can you help me out? So oh. I ended up, I was in the States subbing my mom, you know, uh, to keep a roof over because I thought the last thing I want to do is default on the mortgage. And, mm. you know, that mm. you enter a whole world of pain then. Mm. So I, I was uh, sort of, as they say, uh, what do they call it? It's, uh, as the Americans say, wiring money back to the, you know, yes. to the UK yes. into yes. my mom's account to keep, so she could pay the mortgage. And we came back and we all ended up back in this house that, you know, with my mom in Liverpool, and uh, it was like, that's how we ended up back in this area because we gave up the house in Staffordshire Got to go you. to the States with no Got plans you. of coming back. Uh, and then we're sort of forced to come back. Yes. And here I am. Uh, we got my mum settled, got her a new house. We got a Brilliant. new place to live in. And uh, now, we're, now we're looking again to buy our own place for the first time in about eight years. Uh, Fantastic. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's sort of wacky. But even my wife says to this day she said i never would have moved back up this way if you'd have just su suggested it but yeah. she said the fact that we're almost strong on because we were in the states we had to obviously leave the states because mm. we, we tried to stay out then a lawyer said to me if, if you give me a hundred grand or you sign up to a course with a local university you can stay here to be a student so i was like mm, that's not the idea uh so we were almost strong armed into coming back and my wife said like i said before uh if I'd have just said, let's move back up to the Northwest, let's move back to Liverpool, she probably mm. would never have agreed to because we like where no. we lived. Yeah. But by default, we ended up this way. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, business wise, it, it sort of really worked out for me. Uh, Brilliant. Because when you live in the middle of nowhere, of course, it's nice, but there are no customers. So, no. <laughs> as you know, being in Worcestershire, where, <laughs> where, I, am now, where I am now, you know, n under normal circumstances, you know, I am quite busy and, yes. you know, quite sort of uh, buoyant uh yeah, yeah. so but, but this whole this whole last year as it's coming up to now is the way the world's gone uh it's given me different avenues to explore and and one of the oracle cards i drew before i left the house this morning michael was interestingly again uh it's a share your gifts so uh so maybe that's my cue to sort of get back into broadcasting so to speak so who knows definitely so um Okay, so so tell me then, let's let's go into what like current day, you know, and I know it will vary, but tell us what it is that you offer people, how that manifests, you know, how does that take place? How can people buy your services? Mm -hmm. How can they get in touch with you? So do do the whole kind of business marketing and promotion bit now <laughs> okay sure well uh like i said before i do teach mediumship uh, i did have quite a few students uh, before christmas but of course they uh, they their course finished so uh <coughs> excuse me and the, the teaching is very much online uh, yes uh, and I'm due to go back to the, uh, to Connecticut this coming summer to teach at a spiritualist camp out there. So right. we're in the middle of putting the program together for that. But I've got a book, uh, which is The Room Next Door uh, right. by Andrew D. Now, this is not a let's go and be a medium, read this and you can do mediumship. It's very much a guide that uh, you can buy on Kindle. Sorry, you can buy it on Amazon yeah. uh, for your Kindles or buy the hard copy. Or if you go to my website, andrewd.com, there's a link there to the room next door. Uh, right. And that is sort of my teaching portal. But Got you. You, can, you can also buy the book, and uh, the room next door on there, and I will sign and send you a copy if you do choose to buy it. So that's andrewd.com. Uh, and the website it will take you to is the roomnextdoor.co.uk. Uh, that's why I say just go to my website and follow the link. And if you are already thinking of learning about mediumship, if you are in an open circle, if you are part of a church, if you are developing already, then this book is perfect. And as one guy who bought it recently said, it's very pithy, isn't it, Andrew? And I had to go and look up the word pithy. And mm. it's ba basically sort of nuts and bolts down to the basics. Right. Um, 
The reason I wrote it that way, Michael, is because there was a lady uh, who said to me, should you teach, don't you? I said, yeah, I do, I do. And she said, I could never do that because if I understood how I do what I do or knew how to vocalize it to somebody or teach it to other people, she said, I'd do it, but I don't know how I do what I do. I've just always done it. Yes. And I think that's the difference between, if you like, the working mediums and the teaching mediums. Is It's like, how do you teach somebody else to do what we do today and do it meaningfully? So it's yes. all in the book, The Room Next Door, which is for sale. Uh, I think it's 10 or 12 pounds, something like that. But if you order it directly off me, I will sign a copy and send it to you directly in the mail. Uh, so that's So just to delve into that then, you're saying the website's your learning portal, but the book is kind of getting people's interest up on on the on then doing the learning with you, or how does it work? Or do they, you know, start the course and the first task of the course is read the book? Uh, what I do is uh, I the teaching I do uh, online via Zoom uh, like this is. Yes. Basically, there is there are videos to support what we're doing, videos to uh, back up the, the online teaching alongside yes. the book. So it's all very much together. And people, right. people who are part of spiritualist churches, people who do go to development circles, have bought it and said, what a great read, because it just broke everything down into the, uh, the requisite parts. It's almost like breaking... How do you make an apple pie? This is very much a recipe for mediumship. Now, I will say there are some people out there who have got written, you know, tomes, you know, war and peace, you know, the books like this. Read this book yeah. and you can, you can do mediumship. It's not. I say this is very much part of an overall process. So whether you learn with me or whether you don't, I'm not saying, right. hey, to buy the book, you don't have to learn with me. But right. Make it part of your studies. Make it part of what you're doing make it part of your development gotcha. uh, and that's why i said it's not just read it and then come on the course because there will be elements in there you'll look and go well i know what it says but how do i actually do this so i, mm. I back the book up with my online teachings, with the video teachings uh and you know with worked examples i bring people on board on in the online teachings uh people who will allow you to do practice readings, people who will allow you themselves to be guinea pigs for you. So that's all very much part of what I do. So it, it's very much a, uh, you know, part of a package, to be honest with you, Michael. Yeah. yeah. If that answers and, the question. Yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. And, and um, okay, so I interrupted you, so carry on. Uh, where were we at? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so okay. talked about the book. Yeah, and yeah. Then so my main website is andrewd.com. Uh, that will take you to my other website, which is my teaching portal, which basically tells you about what I do in terms of teaching. And there are a few other links on there, as well as the ability to, to buy this book. Uh, but also, uh, in order to sort of book a reading with me, that's still my main website, andrewd.com. There are links to my YouTube channel, uh, my Facebook page, um, my Twitter feed, uh, Instagram. And uh, I don't think I put TikTok on there yet because I'm just getting into the throes of actually working out what works best for me regarding that. But if you did want to book a session with me, uh, now I do do bereavement counseling, which is something separate. I work for a charity where I do that, but also I do it professionally. Uh, so that is a service you can buy. Uh, but I do one-to-one face-to-face -one, uh, -face readings here in my office uh, as a rule, but uh, a lot more people are obviously selecting online or on the telephone. And yes. as an American lady said to me last week, she said, uh, <clears throat> how does that work? I mean, how can you connect if I'm not in the room? It's actually mm. the, it's the vibration of the voice, Michael. So mm. it's the connection. So if somebody sits there in silence, you know, you've got to have some sort of connection with them. And it's like you're having a conversation. If you, the questions you've asked me today and I've answered them, there's a connection, there's an energy flow between us. And yes. that is exactly the same with mediumship, with a psychic reading. I do use oracle cards. I do use tarot cards as well and angel cards because people like to see the cards as well. And sometimes yes. the cards throw up certain things. But the main thing is if you're on the telephone, uh, as long as you've got that person's voice, you can work with them. Zoom right. is the same. And it, it's nice to have people in the office. It's nice to meet people and, you know, have that human contact with people. But it's not obviously uh, feasible right, you know, now. But no. if people go to my main webpage, andrewd.com, it says there's a link at the top of the page is my services that will show you everything I offer. 
Uh, as a normally, I also offer Reiki healing as well, and I also offer a combination of Reiki and readings as well, mm. uh, and and group sessions as well. Uh, mm. So if somebody wants a group session on Zoom or in the office or whatever, that's perfectly feasible. So that that's how people get hold of me. And that's how people, you know, book with me as well. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so it's, I mean, the the whole topic of say mediumship, and you mentioned their bereavement counselling. Obviously, you know, during this pandemic, there is an awful lot of people crossing to the other side right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's an awful lot of people that are grieving and bereaved at the moment, probably more than there would have been. So how can you, you know, reach out to those people and those folks? And is it appropriate to help them so soon after, you know, these COVID deaths, let's say, mm -hmm. if we were to categorize it? Or, you know, do they need a period of healing first before you can help them um, with the process? Ah, that's a really good question. Uh, somebody's primed you with that question, haven't they? No, uh, <laughs> just, just came up in my head right now. <laughs> well, the, re the reason I said that to you is because uh, the charity I work for as a bereavement counsellor, mm. uh, this will answer the question, then I'll come on to the mediumship side and the spiritual side. Uh, my, I've got a supervisor because, of course, everything there's got to be checks and balances for everything, yes. uh, so that we're not running a mock where with people. Yeah. Uh, and as a rule, the charity, for the most part, people would sit face to face in a room for bereavement counselling for grief counselling. Yeah. And remember as well, grief counselling is not just the death of somebody, the physical death of somebody. It could be the loss of a pet. It could be the loss of a job, the breakup of a relationship. So. Uh, although the charity deals directly with bereavement and the mm. physical death of somebody, I work with all the other sides as well. Gotcha. Anyway, as a rule, those meetings were normally face to face, and of course, with COVID, the, you know we can't meet people face to face no. uh, within the charity. So they were offering Zoom. They've just started offering Zoom uh, sessions now, but mainly telephone. And the telephone side works great for me because. Uh, because I could be at my office uh, talking to you now and have a bereavement counseling session booked at 12 o'clock or what, whenever that might be. And it, it's great because it's very convenient and it, and it flows. But the conversation I had with my supervisor, which I mentioned before, is that because we're now working from telephone and from Zoom, we're able to get through the waiting list of grieving uh, and bereaved people so much quicker Yes. And the conversation we had last week was she said to me, do you know what, Andrew, it's almost a bit too quick because, <coughs> excuse me, there's that period of almost shock and awe and people being frozen uh, and, and just coming to terms with their own loss mm. Uh, mm. and just getting their head around it and trying to accept it within their hearts. Yes. Uh, the, that process needs to happen in itself. And forgive my terminology, but almost they need to, thaw out in a way so that we can reach them mm. uh and so that that used to be like maybe a five month wait a six month wait now people are coming to us with like a two month wait right. uh and they're still very much dealing with their own grief so she yes. said there almost needs to be a buffer in that way so that answers that question do people need to heal in a way yeah. the same goes for mediumship now people say to me how quickly can somebody come through from spirit mm. uh, has it got to be a certain time is it too soon and I've heard some mediums say, oh, that they had a really, you know, uh, awful death or a traumatic death or uh, you know, when they crossed over or passed over. Uh, and I've got to get my terminology right here because with the charity, they do talk about the word death. They said, we don't talk about loss or crossing over so because we have to, people have to really understand that that, and this is the weird bit because that's a separate side of me. The charity mm. talks about that finality, whereas I don't. I talk about the afterlife and I talk about spiritual beings and Got people cr crossing over to the higher side of life. Mm. Uh, so people say to me, how quickly can people come through? And I say, they don't need a little rest. They don't need to be okay. They don't need to be get used to the idea of being in the spirit world. And I've heard some, let's just say, well-known mediums say that to people. Mm. The reason I can say they're wrong is because of the proof I've offered my clients. Mm. Uh, 
And one example was a lady who came to see me with her four daughters and their mom came through from spirit. And we give examples of that spirit communication, you know, evidence, maybe things that's happening around them now that obviously yeah. I just couldn't guess at. Maybe things they did, places they went to, memories, names, evidence, something that you can prove, you know, like concrete. And at the end of it, the lady and her daughters all stood up and said, oh, right, okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, really enjoyed it. We're going now. Thank you. I went, okay. I said, are you going anywhere nice? And she said, oh, well, we're off to see my mom. I was like, hmm? Uh, what am I missing here? And she went, what do you mean? I said, well, am I missing something? Because the lady I've just been speaking with and speaking to and proving that mom has past and she's fine and she made it to the other side and everything's fine and dandy mm. so yeah she's still in the funeral home we've not buried her yet so uh <laughs> I, I was like i was like wow wow okay okay so uh, many many years ago it used to be three days later buried within three days or yes. cremated. but you know yes. these days it can be a week 10 days or whatever depending yeah. on what's happening and that and they all burst out laughing i was like wow okay uh and so there's that side of things. But what I also learned during that sitting was that she brought her daughters with her. And if I just sat with the mom, the, the daughter of the lady who recently yes. passed away, if I just sat with her, she was very much in that space of shock, frozen, still come to terms with it, mm. getting her head around it. Yes. And it's that part of acceptance because you need that energy flow, which I spoke about. Mm. So when somebody sits there and they're holding on to their emotions and holding everything really tightly in, mm. you haven't got that flow. And if no. you were, if you were really upset, Michael, I said, Hey, Michael, how's it going today? What, what's really happening? You go, Hey, Andrew, can't talk, you know, got things going on, got to move. And you try to not engage with people mm. because everything literally may come spilling out. Yeah. It's exactly the same when somebody has lost a loved one. But what I learned most valuable, valuable, I'll say the word again, valuable, be up, <laughs> valuable, valuable, be. I'm not going to get my word, I'm not going to get the tongue. I'm not going to try and correct you because I wouldn't know how to say it. <laughs> right. uh, where I gained the most value that day, okay, perfect, uh, was I learned that through the daughters, I was almost channeling the energy through her daughters and Got using you. their energy. Because right. although they were close to their grandmother, there wasn't that real, you know, people do lose grandmothers and grandfathers and they're really upset, but there mm. wasn't that same level of grief or no. intensity no. of grief. And because there was, it was a grandmother and not a mother who'd passed, they had that degree of separation from her. Yes. So they, they, they viewed the whole thing differently. Uh, and I don't wish to sound flippant, but it's well, some people, oh, yeah, she was old and she was 90 and we wondered how long she'd last, you know, things like that. Mm. But for the daughter, that, that it was a lot more intense for her. And I learned to channel through the daughters and gotcha. draw, draw on the energy that way to bring the evidence of the mother, yeah. uh, the mother who was still very much with us. Mm. Like I said, uh, so it's not how long it is since they've passed. It's where you're at. Yeah. And whether you've yet come to terms. So there was that example. And I'll tell you another really funny story very shortly. Uh, but there was another lady I saw at a mind, body and spirit fair. And I said, look, I said, I know your husband's here. I said, I'll be really honest and say, I'm not really getting an awful lot. And I think I mentioned one thing. I said, you really need to heal. You really need to let him go. And her words were, Andrew, I cannot let him go. It was 42 years ago, and I've worn black since the day he died. So she'd never, ever come to terms mm. with his loss. Mm. Mm. I don't know why. She'd never sought counseling. She'd never sought therapy or anything. Mm. So it, it's literally that's left of arc. One is right of arc. And probably the funniest example, uh, and we did laugh. We, we laughed so much. There was a young lady uh, and at the time, my office wasn't here. I'm, I really do work by appointments only. Where the last place I was at was in a, at the back of a small shop. People knew I was in there. And they'd literally burst through the door and say, is Andrew available? Can I have a read? I need a reading. And I don't normally read for people who just burst in and say, I need a reading. Because sometimes people need that period of reflection where they go, okay, let's calm down. Let's sit on this. Uh, mm. And then go and seek some counsel, so to speak, rather than mm. let's have an immediate fix. Yeah. Anyway, this lady came in. I said, look. Your mother was behind you. She walked in behind you. She sat down with you. I know she's here. Bah, 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 bah. And uh, 
I said, God, I said, your mother was like this crazy raging alcoholic. You know, I'm not, I'm not spilling any beans here. Uh, and so I'm, I'm sorry, but she just gave me a big bag of cocaine. And she said, well, that's the point, Andrew. She said, I kept saying to me, mom, if she stop, doesn't, if she doesn't stop drinking, she stop, doesn't stop doing the coke, she's going to drop dead. And to be honest with you, she only died three days ago. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, I've been waiting for this day forever. I've been waiting for the phone call for years to say she's dropped dead because of the way she lived her life. So, <laughs> so I was like... Wow. Okay. okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's let's re, let, let's sort of uh, let's sort of regain our sort of composure, mm. and and if I'm, and your mom's here, and your mom's doing this, and blah blah blah, blah. and uh, and we laughed so much, and li- as quickly as this, li- and she was only about thirty, this lady, as quickly as as she burst into my office, she said, Andrew, thanks, you've done your job, great job. I know my mom's okay. I'm gonna I've got to go and arrange the funeral now, and I was like. Well, there's two sides of the coin. You know, we, know. we, we laugh in a far different way, but they're often the people that burst into readings, the the, the, the gregarious people, the, the drunks, the, 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 the sort of nutters in this life. They're the ones who go, I made it. I'm fine. I'm okay. Everything's okay. The bar's open. You know, <laughs> there's a 24-hour bar here. I'm fine. Uh, and that's, that, that really is the question I get asked the most. Uh, people yes. say, I could say, oh, I've got your dad here. Dad says he's fine. He made it to the other side. That's great. And people say, well, okay, how do I know it's my dad? Prove it. Tell me something yeah, about him. Yeah, Whereas yeah. On other occasions, I say, I've got your dad here. And, of course, Liverpool is, you know, obviously a seafaring port like Rotterdam. You know, your dad's here. He was a sailor. went away to sea and he did this, blah, 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 you know, and evidence. And, well, is he okay? Did he make it? Is, is he with us now? I said, well, I'd like to think so because what I've just told, do you think I've just made up what? No, no, you couldn't have made that stuff up. Uh, mm. I, I, guess, I guess my dad's here then, isn't he? He's okay. And so the, so you see them going away with the question mark over the head, yeah. but which is good because it wants people, it, it invites people to investigate more, it invites people to find out more, maybe go to another medium. And, mm. and people do that, you know, people sort of, check what I've said against some, what somebody else said. Did you bring the same things up? But you've got to remember my energy is different to the energy of another medium or psyche. So there's going to be a different connection. There are some people, and that's what it's about really, Michael. Uh, it's really that being on the same wavelength. There are people you know that you just totally click with and it just, you don't even need to try within the relationship. No, the the no. connection is there. And yeah. other people, it's like, oh my, it's like, it's like pulling teeth. Okay. And I've always said that some readings are just flow uh, and others, it's a, it's a real battle. But that's where I've got to literally dig out all the tools I've learned and mm-hmm. all the different ways of working and get your client or get my client on side, on my side, yeah. and go, I'm working with you here. It's not a competition. You know, work with me. Let, oh, okay. And you sell me. And if I can just say, one of my chairs, they always sit on the edge. They always sit sort of hunched up like this. And you eventually see them go, <sighs> and you see the, the the sort of them relax and sit back yes. in the chair. And that's when the reading really opens up because they're not holding on to everything. Mm. And that's the main thing. So you said about that connection to spirit and when people, spirit comes through and ha- connecting with people, it's when people physically can open up they i can't make it happen for them no uh i can't tell them how to do it it's got to be something that's natural and when they trust you and when they open up to you and just go (sighs) that's when it flows that's when it flows yeah yeah and that's when it happens yeah yeah Yeah. um i in the in the preamble before we got started um, i mentioned to you that um my wife and i just finished watching on netflix a pro Mm -hmm. a, a mini series called surviving death um, really, really fascinating. They cover every single topic imaginable on around, you know, what happens after death type of yeah, thing. Yeah. And it covered mediumship. It covered um, hot readings, cold readings. It 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 hap- it uh, or what's the term of it? You, um, channeled kind of stuff. That channeled reading. information. Yeah. 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 It covered reincarnation, which was mm-hmm. fascinating. It covered photography uh, of apparitions. Mm-hmm. Um, most fascinating, absolutely some fascinating examples. But inevitably, there is also, I'm sure you know, in all the years that you've been doing it, mm-hmm. people are skeptical yeah, and yeah. doubtful. 
and they're kind of going, mm, you know, I'm not so sure, you know, well, he or she, he could have made that up, you know, yeah. could have made the things fit. Um, I need more proof. I need mean, more concrete stuff. There were people asking for specific signs, so a little bit like your clog, mm -hmm. but then they were asking for specific things. Um, and there were things that people had said before they passed they would make happen mm -hmm. that happened um it was kind of going through through the whole series of programs you have this kind of oh no i'm a bit doubtful about that and then all of a sudden they give you some overwhelming proof um so how do you deal with the skeptics with the doubters with the ones that say oh yeah i'm giving you my money but i'm not really sure you know i'm skeptical about sure, this sure uh, sorry um that tv program is called what happens after death on netflix no surviving oh, death surviving death i'll make a note of that because i yeah, will yeah. watch that uh, definitely yeah. watch it and you know let people know about it too in your work because they will find it fascinating well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Michael, uh, as I always am with everybody, uh, so I do use that phrase quite regularly. Uh, skeptics <laughs> skeptics was a, a problem, uh, I would say, in the early days. And the reason for that was because, you know, I would put on, you know, an advert in the Liverpool Echo and say, you know, uh, psychic readings, mediumistic readings. There was only so much you could put in for you. Yes. <clears throat> you know, your, your £1.50 for per line or whatever. Uh, so there would be always the people who were looking for, and I don't wish to sound dis disingenuous when I say this, but people saw me and what I did as a form of entertainment. They'd get together with a friend Saturday night, you know, nothing better yes. to do, but cheaper than going out to the pictures or going for a meal or whatever. Mm. So I was sort of, I quickly realized, and I think absolutely everybody that steps into this world uh, has got to wake up quickly, but there's only one way you can do it. I, I could tell you this right now. People listening to this will go, mm, yeah, okay, but I've still got to find out for myself. Uh, and that's life, isn't it? You know, yes. uh, you, 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 people can tell you how to live your life and what to do and don't do this and do it, but you still got to find out for yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I quickly learned that, you know, I was the entertainment for the night. And I remember being in one particular house and this lady sat down, there were six, six people. And she said, uh, you're a fraud. I was like, I've not said anything. I said, have they said something? I said, because I always say to people, have you got anything you'd like to ask me? Have I missed out on anything? Or is there something, you know, you hoped I would cover and haven't, you want me to look into? No, fine. Thanks, Andrew. Really enjoyed it. So I always end on that because that sort of gives me that little bit of a comfort blanket that there's nothing left hanging over and people have gone away thinking, oh, you know, never got the answer to what I was looking for. Mm. So this mm. lady sat down. And she said, uh, you're a fraud, uh, and I know you're a fraud, uh, and, you know, I, I'm not going to believe anything you've said. I said, well, I'm not being rude. I said, but all I've asked you is what your name is. I said, and we've not spoken. You're a fraud. I said, oh, right, okay. And then I quickly realized she said something, and I noticed that a, a speech was slightly slurred, but <clears throat> and she got tongue-tied. I said, how much have you had to drink? And she said, uh, so this is something else you learn. Uh, oh, I just had a few glasses of wine with my friends. I said, okay. And then she turned around and said, tell you what, give me a free reading and I won't tell the others you're a fraud. And I was like, out, out. So luckily she was the last, oh no, tell you what, she was the second to last. I'll never forget this. She was the second to last person. And then, and of course, that totally threw me, put me in a spin. And, yes asked her to leave and I was expecting them all to burst through the door and uh, she just went to the and then the next lady came in and I said okay spirit I've got to pick this up the floor off the floor I've got to regain my composure I've got to sort myself out because this next lady wants the best out of me and sat down she went great I really enjoyed it thank you and I was almost like a school teacher and being an ex-military officer I got them all lined up in the kitchen and all the money was on the table and I said, uh, does anybody feel that they've been ripped off or I'm a fraud or somehow they've been diddled tonight and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, somehow feel like they've been ripped off? And this lady picked up the money. Another lady picked up the money and said, you've earned every penny tonight. I said, thank you. Good night, ladies. And I left. Uh, so that's, that's sort of back in the day and that sort of learning the hard way. 
And there are always going to be people, I used to get them, you know, oh, well, I went to this other psychic and I'll see if you're as good as her and I'll see if you mention what she mentioned. And yes. I'll, That's not the point. Yes. Is, that all, is that all you've come for today? Mm. And I'm going to sound really, really sort of harsh now and business-like because that's the way it sort of goes. Mm. But my brother's got his own catering business and all he wanted to do was provide good quality food to everybody that could afford it and just do a good job for people. Yes. And then he quickly realized that, you know, people weren't respecting what he was doing and people were basically taking him for a ride. Mm. So basically he, he doubled his prices overnight and said, I'm going to just do corporate clients and I'm just going to do this. And, and they're the only people I want to work with because, yes. you know, he's been in the business for 30 years plus now. Yes. And he said, I want people to enjoy what I do, get the most out of what I do, but sit back and go, and we remember the food. And what I did was because I realized that, forgive me for saying this, people, but, you know, there was sort of the thrill seekers, people looking for something to do, people with nothing yes. better to do. Yes. Uh, I thought, no, I want to work with people. I really want to help people, guide them, yeah. and uh, help them find their way in life. And um, if there are speed bumps coming up in life and obstacles, help mm. them navigate those so that they get to the other side and go, you know, Andrew, Andrew really helped me. Mm. So uh, for the, the services I charge, I, I still believe I'm not the most expensive person in the world, but I put my prices up because one lady came to see me, great reading, Andrew, loved it, really did. I'm uh, going to tell all my friends, there's a waiting list. They're all waiting to see how I, people used to send somebody to test me and then send all the friends. Yes. And uh, she said, I'm going to tell all my friends how amazing my reading was and to come and see you. And for some reason, she got hold of the wrong end of the stick with the amount of money because she paid a deposit online. And uh, so th this is a real sort of fly in the ointment. This is the bit I don't like talking about, but no. it, it's part of it because it makes it sound like it's just about the money, but it, it's not. But people have got to realize that they are going to develop and grow as mediums and clairvoyants and psychics. And then the, uh, the subject of price comes up. You are going to go through this. So please learn from you know what I went through. Anyway, this lady got hold of the wrong end of the stick. And she was like, I thought I only owed you this amount. And it's not, it's that amount. Mm. And her word, her parting words were, after saying, what a great reading. She said, if I'd known it was this much, I never would have come in the first place. Mm. I was like, so the people who really do need the guidance, need the help, need the inspiration, if you like, and the insights and the connection with their loved ones, they will come. They do respect the work I do. I do my very best for them, and I work on their behalf with the spirit world to bring closure sometimes as well. Yes. And there's a good working relationship, and that's, that's got to be the case in every respect, that you've got a good connection with your clients and you work with them. Uh, because if, if they can get that peace of mind and that closure and feel like there is a point to everything, then... And, and life is worth living when they've lost somebody then or that their death their physical death wasn't in vain and they are okay in the spirit world mm -hmm. then that's the work i want to do and pe people arrive and come from a good place uh, and i can work with those people yes. uh, and that as long as those people are in a good place when they arrive and i can put them in a better place then yes that's what i'm here for and and thank you andrew and i, I think the same applies for anybody who's running their own business. Mm. You know, it's it's a great story and a metaphor for everybody because we are all small businesses are going to get clients who are going to say things like your client did, mm -hmm. who are going to talk about the money bit. And all small businesses don't like talking about it. And all small businesses are undercharged too. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's it's a really good message for everybody out there that's listening who's not just interested in mediumship or psychic development. It's about anybody who's starting their own business. It's it's a really, really good point. Yeah, and I think, Michael, the main thing is I started doing what I did literally as a passion. Just I was had a daytime job. Mm. I was just in the uh, spiritual churches. Yes. And this whole subject of money, especially for small businesses, and there was a couple of gurus, gurus, uh, business gurus, marketing people I linked up with last year. Mm. Uh, and they worked with people from all walks of life, you know, all sorts of businesses. And one of them was actually a life coach. Yes. Uh, which is sort of part of what I do anyway. Of course. And uh, what she said to me, well, Andrew, she said, they're not just paying you for 
and I will go back to what I said that a lot of people start their businesses out of a passion, especially one, right. man, one man bands or just two. You know, I love my art and I, I want to sell my art and, mm. you know, bring pleasure to people. But mm. this one lady said to me, she said, they're not just paying you for that 45 minutes or that hour of your time. I've spent thousands on training. That's you know, right. I, I went to the States. I spent thousands, come back with $200 in my pocket. You know, that's right. Uh, I've been there and done well. I've been there and not done well. That's right. Uh, so, and she said, it's all your experience. It, mm. It's, for example, the money you paid to write your book because you had to literally pay to have that published. Yes. Uh, and, it, and you've put all of your experience and your knowledge and everything else into that. So they are drawing on your 10, 12, 14 years of experience, not just 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and, and as I said before, you know, there are times when it, it just goes swimmingly and there are other times when people are clammed up, people are desperately upset, people are just totally lost. And yes. I've, got to, I've got to really dig deep then yeah. on their behalf yeah. to help draw them towards, you know, a good place. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's all those years of experience. Uh, mm. You know, for example, the last year, I'm, I've been really honest. I think I'm doing about 25% of what I did before. Yeah. You know, and I've still got to survive somehow. That's so, right. But anybody in a small business, in any walk of life, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, all I'm going to say is know your worth. And, you know, you might look at the competition and say, well, they charge X amount for this. Mm. I'm going to pitch it around there. Be prepared if you feel like you're worth it to mm. pitch above that because the people who really want to see you and the people who want your product, they will, you know, if you're selling nuts and bolts, if you're selling widgets or whatever, or design work or artwork, the people who really want you will come and they will see you and it will work out. Brilliant. That's a fantastic note to end on, I think, Andrew. Um, now tell us, just remind everybody, just to have a quick summary at the end in terms of where they can find you. Where's the best place for them to hook up with you with anything that they might want, whether it's your psychic training, mediumship training, or whether it's getting a reading or anything else? Okay. The best place to come, Michael, even if you just Google Andrew D or Psychic Andrew D or Medium Andrew D, but just go straight to my website, Andrew D, and that's Andrew, D-E-E dot -E com, Andrew D dot com. Perfect. And if they want to follow on there, all the social media links are on there. So if they want to click on those as well, they can get and find you. And if they're on TikTok, just find, just go for medium Andrew D, I, I would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> yes. ne nearly all of my social media handles are at medium Andrew D. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Really enjoyed it. Go and watch that program on Netflix. You will love it. Uh, I guarantee you, I did. And um, hopefully we will meet in person one day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Who knows sure. what happens? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never. And like I said, I, I literally stumbled across you. So uh, I, I believe there's a reason for everything. So thank you, Michael. Thanks again. No problem. Take Speak care to you now. soon. Take care. Bye, -bye. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.